Thank you all for coming. My name is Michael Stapelberg, and uh, the title of this presentation is Kinex Keyboard Hacking. This was the shortest I could come up with uh, to make the sort of long and unwieldy name of uh, Kinesis Custom Keyboard Controller much shorter to type for the benefit of my folder names. So what's on our agenda for today? Uh, first of all, obviously, I'm going to talk about the custom keyboard controller, which I have built. Uh, then I'm going to motivate why, with a custom keyboard controller, it also makes sense to maybe build a custom USB hub. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about input latency measurements. So what's the motivation for building your own keyboard controller? Well, I bought uh, a Kinesis Advantage keyboard, like you can see on the slide here, in 2008. Uh, so I've been using it for uh, just 10 years at this point, and I think it's the best keyboard that I've ever used. It's a great keyboard, but there are two things that I didn't like about it. Uh, first of all, it uses brown Cherry MX key switches. And second of all, it had an annoying stuck modifier bug. So let's talk about these two things in a little bit more detail. Some of you might be aware that uh, Cherry MX is a very popular brand of key switches. They come in a variety of different models. You can see them here in a grid by their individual properties. The Kinesis keyboard uses the uh, key switch at the um, in the middle here at the top, the brown tactile soft one. But I had been typing on the blue ones, the clicky soft ones, for a number of years before I got my first Kinesis. So naturally, my question was, can I get a Kinesis but with the blue key switches? Unfortunately, the Kinesis sales support told me that they can't give me one of these. But the tech support actually shipped me the raw PCBs and the key wells. So there I was. Uh, I had the PCBs. Uh, I got the key switches uh, that correspond to this. I'll tell you more about that in a second. And I soldered them in manually. I think the result is actually much better than what Kinesis does, because uh, when I did it, I fixed the PCB on the well with uh, soldering the topmost and the bottommost key switches, whereas Kinesis just uses glue all over the place. It's like horrible soldering. But um, that was that, and it worked beautifully, and this was my first modification of this keyboard. Um, if you pay attention, and if you haven't been doing much keyboard design of your own, you'll see that we have a number of key switches here, but only these 13 ports to actually interface this particular board with the rest of the keyboard. This is because uh, keyboards are usually laid out in a matrix design so that you can connect multiple key switches on an individual microcontroller input line. With keyboard matrices, there is one problem, which is that uh, of the so-called ghosting effect uh, or the blocking effect. So what happens is you have a switch like here, which is closed. You have another one which is closed, a third one which is closed, and then the fourth one you can't really tell whether it's open or closed just by how the current flows through the matrix. And uh, depending on how your um, keyboard controller handles the situation, you either get ghosting, where you get a key press, the fourth one here, which you didn't actually press, or you get blocking, where in order to prevent ghosting, the keyboard controller will just say, well, if these three keys are pressed, I will always just ignore the fourth key. <coughs> right? So this is a problem to a certain extent in the cheaper keyboards for uh, usages where people don't press too many keys at once, it's probably OK. Nobody's going to notice. But the Kinesis is a keyboard where you can remap any key in hardware. So uh, I think that was one of the motivating factors as to why Kinesis really wanted to solve this problem. And uh, the technical term for this is N key rollover. So you can have multiple keys and any number of keys, in fact, pressed at the same time. So this is why the Kinesis switches come with diodes in them. Uh, both of obviously the brown ones, but also the blue ones that I wanted to exchange. Otherwise, if I didn't put the diodes in, it wouldn't work right. So this is the model number of the Cherry MX key switch that I got. And the D uh, stands for diode. Unfortunately, these are very hard to get. So you can't just go online to the big electronic stores and order a bunch of them. There are, however, uh, three different ways with which I got to these key switches in the past. The first one, which I used when I started the original project, is you contact Cherry and you nicely ask them for samples. And two days later, you have samples in your mail. That obviously works, and it's nice and cheap because they came for free. But uh, you obviously can't abuse uh, Cherry's generous sample policy for every individual keyboard that you built. So uh, for the second keyboard that I built, um, I uh, went with a group order in the Desk Authority Forum, where some guy apparently just ordered a whole bunch of them to get around the minimum order quantity of the lesser frequented key switches. And now he's selling them off in batches of 100 or so. That works, but it takes a long time uh, to process that order. And it's a very arcane interface to get your key switches, because you send a private message in some random forum and hope that a bot responds. 
And then the last uh, most labor intensive method that I have actually used is to buy the regular key switches without the diodes, buy a whole bunch of diodes and then open each individual key switch and put a diode in them. This takes a bunch of hours for one keyboard, but it does work. So uh, if both of the other ways don't work for you, this might be a good alternative. So circling back to the other thing that I uh, wanted to change about my keyboard, the stack modifier bug. What do I mean when I say that? Uh, what I did was I press shift, I press A, I release A, and I release shift, but the keyboard would not see the release shift event. So that means your modifier is stuck, and you would still write uppercase even though you wanted to write lowercase. This is super annoying if it happens frequently, and it did happen multiple times a week for me. Um, so I was annoyed enough by it that I contacted or that I did some research and found out that in the forums, people are saying that Kinesis Tech Support actually knows about this issue. So I contacted Tech Support, and uh, of course, they played their whole spiel with regards to resetting the keyboard to its factory defaults and running a bunch of diagnostic steps until they were reasonably confident that they would actually need to fix this issue for me. So they agreed to send me a firmware update, and I thought, well, that's great. Just send me the file. I'll update it, right? But uh, what I didn't expect was that after they asked me for my address, I would get an actual microcontroller in the physical mail after a certain time, uh, along with a printed instruction of how to change it. So I opened the keyboard, uh, removed the old microcontroller, put in the new microcontroller, and that made things better. This, the shift key was not getting stuck uh, as often as previously, but it was still getting stuck. So that's sort of annoying. But more significantly, the caps lock key was also getting stuck. It used to do that before, but it was entirely unchanged. So this is important for me because I'm using an ergonomic keyboard layout called a Neo layout, where the caps lock key is actually very frequently involved in almost everything you type. So I can understand why Kinesis Tech Support didn't quite realize the significance of the caps lock key for me personally. So probably this solved the issue nicely for most of their other customers, but for me, it was unacceptable. So I had to do something about it myself. Luckily, I found a series of blog posts from a person calling themselves Humble Hacker, which was a great reverse engineering of an older version of the Kinesis Advantage keyboard. They uh, had a bunch of pictures that really explained uh, the mapping of the individual matrix positions and how the keyboard worked and how they implemented their own keyboard controller. Uh, and they also delivered a custom firmware, which I presumed would not have the stuck modifier bug. So I decided to replicate the project in 2013. Um, I'm going to share the slides later, and there's links to everything I'm referencing. Uh, the link on this slide goes to my write-up of how I rebuilt um, the, the Humble Hacker work for my particular keyboard revision, because as I mentioned, it was for an older one, so I sort of ported it forward to my keyboard revision. And um, this is the result. You can see on the left-hand side of the slide the uh, PCB design. On the right-hand side, you can see the actual build. So you see the PCB, and uh, on top of it is the microcontroller that uh, the Humble Hacker work was using. So at the time, I had no clue whatsoever about PCB design, so a friend of mine helped me with this quite a bit. Uh, you can see that in the middle of this design, you just have a bunch of pins for the Teensy microcontroller. And I'm going to talk more about that in just a second. And then on each of the edges, like down here and up there, you have a port which interfaces with the rest of the keyboard, so the key wells that we've seen in the earlier photo. And then on the bottom here, you just have a bunch of LEDs to show the status of NumLock and Caps Lock and all of these. So if you think about it, there's not much going on on this board. It's just a bunch of wiring. So you can think of it as really a relatively big breakout board for a Teensy microcontroller to interface with a Kinesis keyboard. So this build was a relatively conservative approach. It uses the Teensy++ microcontroller, which is exactly the same one that Humble Hacker used. It uses the Humble Hacker firmware. And this has actually worked well for the last four years. So why bother changing? Well, people on the internet started writing about input latency. There's this excellent post from Pavel Fatten called Typing with Pleasure. And even if you're not into the subject so much, I would recommend to read this post because it's just a really excellent write-up. I really enjoyed reading it. So after reading it, I wondered, well, what is the input latency of my particular keyboard? And I realized that nobody would ever be able to tell me. Because even if people went out and did extensive measurements on common keyboards and their controllers, mine wouldn't be in there because it's custom. right? So obviously, it fell onto me to measure the latency of my keyboard. And then once I have these results, the next obvious question is, what can I change about this, if anything? And how far can I reduce the latency? So this is where the journey starts. If you think about it conceptually, there are a number of sources of input latency. 
What a keyboard controller does uh, on a very high level is it does the matrix scan to figure out which of the keys are currently pressed. It does debouncing, and I'm going to talk about bouncing in just a second. And then uh, it communicates the state of the currently pressed keys to the computer using USB. Now, the matrix scan itself takes a certain amount of time, but it's mostly negligible if you don't do it absolutely horribly. Then you have the debouncing, which is very easy to get wrong in terms of additional input latency. And I'm going to show you how this looks like in just, just a minute. And then the USB pull is where you just have to wait for USB to give you a chance to actually send your packet. Uh, because USB up until version 3 didn't have any interrupts, so it, it is a polling protocol, and each device specifies how frequently it is being polled. So depending on the USB device descriptor that your firmware has, this might take longer or shorter. But the point I'm trying to make on the slide is that if your key press comes at a very inopportune moment, it might be that all of these three big sources of input latency can add up in just the wrong way, so to say. Of course, on the flip side, if your key press comes in at just the right moment, like just before the matrix scan starts and then just before a USB poll happens, then you might have very, uh, a very small input latency. So how does the Humble Hacker firmware fare with regards to input latency? Well, first of all, it only does keyboard matrix scans after each USB poll. This uh, is, as far as I understand, this firmware, and I have to admit that I'm not an expert on it, um, but this seems like a strange decision if you're optimizing for input latency. So maybe the answer is just, well, Humble Hacker didn't optimize for input latency, and this had other benefits. I'm not entirely sure. So we'll have to maybe wait for a USB poll before a scan to even start. So far, so good. Next up, debouncing. The debouncing is actually my fault because I contributed this to the Humble Hacker firmware. Before I implemented it, it didn't have any debouncing, and that frequently gave me key presses that I didn't want. So I contributed this, but in my naivete back then, I implemented it in such a way that it would wait for eight presses in a row. I actually pulled up the commit message earlier today in preparation for this, um, and I noticed that it even said, well, the eight here is just a number that I came up with. There's like no substance to it. I didn't do any measurements. It could be that it doesn't work for you. It's just what seemed to work for me. So, so much for this. Um, and then the defaults of this keyboard firmware were to have a device descriptor in which it would specify that it would be polled every 10 milliseconds. So if you sort of add this up, if you have one poll, and that means one keyboard matrix scan every 10 milliseconds, and you wait for eight presses in a row until a key is actually treated as pressed, that would be 80 milliseconds, right? Which actually seems like noticeable, right? So the first thing I did was I changed the 10 milliseconds to one milliseconds, which drastically reduces your latency. Um, that was a very easy change to make. I just deleted a zero, so. Um, but then uh, let's see what else I could do about it, right? I tried improving the debouncing because there is a better strategy, and I'm going to demonstrate that strategy in just a second. But for some reason, my attempt at improving the debouncing failed. The problem was um, I, I didn't actually diagnose why it failed, but the problem was that my environment in which I was developing was not conducive to the kind of work that I was doing. So I was changing the firmware of the only keyboard that I was also typing on, which is not a great idea. You probably want to have a separate keyboard for debugging this. Um, and it, just didn't quite work right. Something felt odd. It didn't produce the key presses I wanted, so I just reverted back to the last known firmware and sort of gave up. So at that point, I came to the realization that clearly what I would need to do is learn more about how, how all of this works. So I decided to implement the firmware from scratch. And then I figured, well, if I'm implementing a firmware from scratch, maybe I should also upgrade to a newer version of the Teensy microcontroller while I'm at it so that the design won't be obsolete as quickly. The old design had still a mini USB port, not even a micro USB port. Um, and I was running out of cables for that particular port, so better upgrade. So I've mentioned the Teensy a couple of times. And here I have a slide where you can see the Teensy++, the original one that Humble Hacker used in the original work in 2013. Um, that's a 16 megahertz microcontroller from Atmel. Um, it is, the Teensy is very popular in like the hobby electronics scene because it has a whole bunch of GPIO outputs. Um, all of these uh, holes that you can see here can be used pretty much for whatever you like. And in addition, it is very, very easy to get started with this microcontroller development board because all you need is a USB port here and then you have this convenient push button on the right-hand side of the board. And once you push the button, the controller will accept a new firmware file over USB. So you really don't need a separate programmer or a JTAG adapter or anything like that. You can very quickly get going with this. Uh, on the bottom, you can see the Teensy 3.6, which is the current version of the Teensy. It is a 180 megahertz microcontroller, 
uh, based on an ARM Cortex M4. Um, that's the, the chip you see here. Uh, it uses micro USB, it still has the physical push button, and it has more GPIOs, but that's not relevant for what we're going to use it for. So let's design a new keyboard controller. What you can see here is the board with which I started. This was, in fact, the first board that I ever made for this project. Um, you can see that it is etched, not manufactured. Uh, we made it at university back then. And you just have a whole bunch of pins that you can use to sort of break out the Kinesis keyboard. And then I wired them all up to a Teensy 3.6 to verify that the matrix design that I, was, that I wanted to use would actually work on this microcontroller. Because sometimes there might be additional pin functions that you didn't account for, and then you can't use that as a GPIO pin or something like that. So this is a good first step to make it work. I also figured that given that uh, I wanted to do it right this time, I would also clean up the schematic and the board while I was at it because the uh, older um, artifacts that I had published from my older project were my first electronics project. So uh, there were many things to improve. For example, I wanted to use names which would actually match what is printed on the Kinesis PCBs so that if you're actually disassembling the keyboard, it is easier to figure out what goes where. Um, there was a known dimension issue where the hole to actually fix the keyboard controller in the keyboard was not at the right position. So it would be good to actually be able to screw your keyboard controller into the keyboard. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to reroute the keyboard matrix from the original Humble Hacker GPIO mapping to one that is more convenient for me, because it doesn't really matter which row of the keyboard matrix is wired up to which GPIO. So you have some flexibility there and can make a cleaner design in terms of the board design. So this is the result. Uh, you can see that the PCB changed color. It is no longer green. It is purple. This is because I made it at Oshpark instead of the previous PCB manufacturer that I used. But otherwise, it looks pretty much the same, right? You still have uh, the various connectors for the keyboard itself. And then in the middle, you have the large number of pins and the Teensy on top of it. But this time, it's the Teensy 3.6 and no longer the old Teensy++. On the right-hand side, you can see it inserted into the keyboard and wired up. Um, and this worked. So. Let's move on to the firmware then. I wrote an almost from scratch firmware. I'm saying almost from scratch because I was reusing the Teensy 3 linker scripts because it's really no fun to write your own linker scripts, especially if you're getting into areas like uh, DMA controllers for the USB transfers and stuff like that, where the alignment and positioning and stuff like that is really important. So it made sense to sort of reuse the trusted known working Teensy 3 linker script. But aside from that, I did pretty much everything myself. Uh, I came up with custom startup code to initialize the microcontroller. I wrote a mostly myself uh, USB stack, and I wrote entirely myself the keyboard code. So the idea was to really go all the way bare metal to ensure that nothing gets in the way. There should not be any additional like scheduling latency or anything like that. Uh, I really wanted to be sure of every instruction that was in this project, and I wanted to be able to measure and debug every instruction that was in there. So what is the result? The new firmware has a matrix scan which adds up to 0.1 milliseconds of delay, um, just because it takes some time to activate all of the individual rows and then read in the columns. And this is uh, what sums up to 0.1 milliseconds. Um, I will note that I'm running the Teensy 3.6 at its full 180 megahertz, which is hopeless overkill, but why not? Um, I'm also running scan in a busy loop, not just on USB pole. So uh, we have that delay no longer in our pipeline. Uh, furthermore, as sort of a micro-optimization, I'm reading all of the columns with a single memory access. So they're all wired up to a single GPIO port. The alternative would be to have them on multiple ports, and then you need multiple memory accesses. It probably doesn't really matter, but I figured I would go all the way, because that's sort of the spirit of this project. So I mentioned debouncing earlier a couple of times. And this is what uh, a bouncing key switch looks under an oscilloscope. So on the right uh, capture file here, you see a key switch which is not activated. And then up here, it becomes activated. But what happens in between here is what's called bouncing. So the mechanical making contact of the key switch results in it triggering a bunch of times. And what happens when you uh, read in the key switch here, and then you read it again here, and then you read it again here is you would perceive this one activation of, let's say, the A key as two or even three activations of the A key. Um, so that's not something that you want to have. So there are a bunch of strategies to avoid this. The uh, relatively obvious but also not great strategy at, uh, uh, as to how to deal with debouncing is to just reduce your scan rate. So if your key switches bounce for a certain time and Cherry MX key switches are specified to bounce for up to five milliseconds in their data sheet, then just make your scan rate slower than five milliseconds and you will never read a bounce or you will only ever read like one point that is in a bounce. 
So this does work, but it has the ugly side effect that the worst case latency now is that you are starting to read uh, the matrix just before uh, it actually goes up and is bouncing here. And then you need to wait for the next scan, which is more than five milliseconds by definition, um, until you actually read the key press. So um, the worst case latency is like five milliseconds or whatever time you use for actually debouncing your keys. So this is not a great approach. Um, another more frequently used approach is to scan more quickly than that, because also you need to scan more quickly to do the sort of uh, ghosting slash blocking prevention that I talked about earlier. Um, if you don't have the diode. So I can see why this is a common approach. And uh, in this approach, we are scanning a bunch of times, but uh, for every key that we're looking at, we are waiting for five milliseconds until we actually register this key as pressed. This is very similar to what I explained earlier that I introduced in the Humble Hacker Firmware, where I waited just eight intervals before a key was treated as pressed. So you can see this in a bunch of uh, different keyboard firmwares. And in fact, I don't think I actually came up with this when I contributed it to Humble Hacker. Uh, I just copied it from somewhere else. Now, it is fairly obvious when you get told how it works that the winning strategy here is to first trigger and then wait instead of waiting first and triggering later. Um, so by just saying, OK, if I see a change in the voltage of that key, I'm going to say it triggered now, and then I block it for five more readings or however long you want to debounce it. This also works for the key release in just the same way. So this is like a very simple but very effective way of getting rid of debounce latency altogether. So in total, what's the verdict? Uh, we have up to 0.1 milliseconds of scan latency. We have just entirely eliminated debounce latency. But we still have the one millisecond of USB pole latency. So if you look at the bracket in which the input latency is, you can see that in the best case, if everything lines up just perfect, it's going to be zero milliseconds. But the worst case is 1.1 milliseconds. So far, so good. But the obvious question is, can we reduce the latency any further? For this, we're going to look at USB. As you all know, over the last couple of years, USB had a bunch of different revisions. USB 1 had a full speed, uh, maximum speed of 12 megabits. USB 2 introduced high speed mode, which is 480 megabits. And USB 3 introduced super speed, which is 5 gigabits. While that is impressive, the more interesting thing that changed over these standards is the microframe duration. The microframe was defined in USB 1 as 1 millisecond, and in USB 2 as 125 microseconds. In USB 3, they introduced interrupts, so microframes are no longer a thing to worry about. So this is interesting because a microframe is also the unit in which you specify the polling frequency. So uh, with a USB 1 device, you could only ever poll as quickly as one millisecond. But with a USB 2 device, uh, you can actually go down to 125 microseconds. So the next step is fairly clear, right? We're going to look at whether we can use USB high speed. And it turns out the Teensy's microcontroller actually does have two USB ports. It has the USB FS port, which is full speed, unsurprisingly, and USB HS, which is high speed. These two ports use entirely different software stacks. The USB HS1 uses a new IP core, and I think they just kept the old IP core around for compatibility so that customers who had already written a program for the older port could just keep using it when they upgraded to a, new, to a newer version of this microcontroller. The Teensy, unfortunately, only ever uses USB FS, and the USB HS port is only used optionally and only for host mode. So that would mean when you connect like an external keyboard to your microcontroller and you wanted to use it, that's host mode. But I needed it in device mode. I figured that given that the software support is in very early stages for the host mode, it would not make any sense for me to step in and sort of try to port this forward to the device mode. Rather, I looked elsewhere. And it turns out that NXP, the manufacturer of the microcontroller, actually offers an SDK with a bunch of examples. And these examples do cover USB HS. Unfortunately, the examples don't run as they are on the Teensy because the two use different clocks. So the Teensy uses a 16 megahertz crystal, and the uh, NXP development board uses a 12 megahertz crystal. So this needs to be changed. And then in addition, also the serial port setup code needed to be fixed. I'm not entirely sure why that is, because it should only depend on the clocks, and I fixed those. But I needed to change it. I documented what I needed to change in the forum post that I've linked here, just in case anyone else wants to replicate this. Unfortunately, still, the USB HS port didn't quite work in my tests on the Teensy. This is one of these scenarios like earlier where I didn't go back and debug it after the fact. I'm just stating that it didn't work at the time. So I continued looking, and I found the UTasker firmware, which works on the Teensy among other platforms as well. And it also implements USB HS, but with its own driver. 
this worked. So I could get the USB HS port to work on the TNZ by using the UTasker thing, which kept me motivated and going. But UTasker is a fairly heavyweight thing. You can think of it almost like an operating system. Like it has the, the concept of tasks and scheduling between them and stuff like that, which is probably OK. Like the Teensy is probably fast enough for this to not play any role whatsoever. But as I mentioned, I wanted to stay as close to bare metal as possible for this project. So I figured I'd discard UTasker and use something else. So now that I know that I can, in theory, use that USB HS port, I was faced with another more practical problem, which is that the USB HS port, as I explained, is optional. And this is the pin header on which it is uh, available on the Teensy. Now, the problem is that there is no physical space for these pins or a breakout board mounted to these pins in any way to fit into the keyboard. In fact, the photo that I have here is of a keyboard controller which is entirely useless because the sockle itself is too high for the keyboard. Um, I only realized this after soldering it, so, well. Um, so we needed a different way to, to use the USB HS port on the Teensy. And the next obvious step is, of course, to design another keyboard controller, where instead of using a sockle Teensy, we would directly use the microcontroller, which is found on the Teensy. I decided to keep the Teensy bootloader chip, which is what does the press a button and go into programming mode thing, because it is also available for custom projects and it is a nice fail safe so that you can easily reprogram the thing via USB. Uh, it is, in general, very good to keep the changes minimal between different hardware revisions, much like in software, um, just to make sure that everything works. So here you can see the result of the next revision of the keyboard controller. It is a little bit more complicated than the previous iteration. Um, but uh, on the right-hand side, you can see a build. So let's go through the components quickly. There's not that much going on. You can see the USB HS port on the left-hand side, the USB FS port on the right-hand side, a little bit of power circuitry up here, the termination for the USB traces, a bunch of capacitors around the microcontrollers to sort of <laughs> smooth out the power supply, then the actual microcontroller, which is used on the Teensy, the bootloader companion chip, and the associated push button. And aside from that, there's just a debug header here for the serial interface of this microcontroller and a programming header here so that instead of pushing this button physically, which is very hard to reach because you need to sort of open your keyboard and reach underneath and find it, uh, I could programmatically enter programming mode, which uh, is very nice. So I built up a development setup like uh, depicted here. Uh, you can see what comes out of the keyboard on the left is a USB to serial adapter. What comes out on the right is a so-called rebootor, which is a terminology that the Teensy community uses for another Teensy whose only purpose is to put the target Teensy into programming mode. Um, this is very convenient because now you can have like a, a make file that will automatically just put it into programming mode, reprogram it, etc. So regarding the firmware uh, for this new build, um, I based it on NXP's SDK and the USB HS port, um, contrary to what I uh, reported earlier where it didn't work on the Teensy, it worked out of the box on my hardware. So this was very good to see because it meant that no longer would I need to maintain my bare metal version. The bare metal firmware version that I told you about earlier was still useful to get a broader understanding of the entire subject area and also to compare the timings with what I was building here to make sure that the uh, NXP SDK doesn't introduce any additional latency that I don't know about. But the SDK is actually fairly reasonable. It's also pretty much bare metal. There's nothing uh, in the way and the timings actually match. So that was good. I decided to implement this firmware revision using the MCU Expresso IDE, which is an IDE that NXP ships. Um, this is relatively interesting to me because I hadn't worked with such an IDE before. I always uh, was just like the uh, command line person and do everything yourself. Um, but there are a couple of nice features in that IDE. For example, there's a graphical clock configuration tool and a pin configuration tool for your microcontroller. Um, so this might help getting started. But then uh, after that, it's just a regular Eclipse IDE, and the integration isn't so great between these tools. So I would recommend to actually, once you have your Hello World running on the microcontroller and you're happy with your configuration, stitch it and use something that you're more comfortable with. So what's the verdict now for the new firmware? Well, the scan latency is still the same. You can't quite reduce it anymore. The debounce latency is still non-existent, but now the USB pole latency is reduced to 125 microseconds. So now the input latency is, uh, in the best case, 0, and in the worst case, 0 0.2 milliseconds, which I think is really good. The lessons learned from this particular part of the project are that the NXP microcontroller documentation is unfortunately rather sparse. This surprised me a little bit coming from the Atmel microcontrollers, which are really well documented. Um, but it seems to be the norm for our microcontrollers. So that's unfortunate, but nothing you can do about it. <laughs>
In retrospect, I should have also really started with the development board of that microcontroller. Like if I had uh, done the project again and with the benefit of hindsight, I wouldn't have used the Teensy. The only reason I used the Teensy was back then because it was easy to get started with it and the humble hacker firmware used it. Um, but if I had used the development board from the very beginning, I would have had access to JTAG debugging. So a full blown GDB with which I can single step through individual lines of firmware code, which is so much more helpful than just serial printf. Um, and also, it would have allowed for much easier porting of the vendor examples, so I wouldn't have to spend a week on figuring out what the differences are between the TNZ initialization code and the NXP vendor initialization code. Um, but hindsight's 2020. So um, that concludes the custom keyboard controller part. Now let's motivate why I also needed a custom USB hub. Well, the keyboard controller needs two cables, one for the USB FS port and one for the USB HS port, because the FS port is where we upload the firmware and where we also get the power from, and the HS port only uses the data lines. Now, you could, of course, say, well, why didn't you design it so that the USB HS port would also be able to draw power? But the problem is that even then, I would sometimes need to connect to the USB FS port because that's what the TNZ uh, bootloader chip uses to get the new firmware. So I figured I would just leave it as is um, and just deal with the two cables and uh, leave aside like the cleanup to just use one USB port for whenever we're redesigning the project in the next major revision. So we need two internal cables, but even without the need for two cables and wanting to have everything clean, it would have been nice to use a, a hub. And in fact, the Kinesis comes with an integrated hub, but this hub uses proprietary connectors. On the bottom right here, you can see the connector that uh, connects with the USB cable that the keyboard comes with. And to its left, you have another proprietary connector which connects to the keyboard controller itself. Now, it turns out the keyboard controller itself that Kinesis used, at least back when I bought my Kinesis keyboards, was still using PS2 and not USB. So the conversion from PS2 to USB happened on this particular hub. This also implies that if we wanted to use uh, this hub for our design, we couldn't do it because our design is a USB keyboard controller and not a PS2 keyboard controller. But even if that was not an issue, this hub only supports USB 1.1, which as we identified is too slow for our reduced input latency. So we need USB 2 or better. And also lastly, there was one known issue with this hub where some devices just didn't work when I plugged them in. And I didn't quite realize why that is, but I figured it might be a good opportunity to get to the bottom of this. So. The decision is to design your own USB hub because unfortunately I could not find an open hardware USB hub design. Now, of course, I'm gonna release mine as open hardware. So in case any one of you needs a USB hub, there you go. Um, maybe you can send some bug fixes back once you figure them out. Um, and I hope that it comes in handy for other people. So uh, before designing uh, the USB hub, I surveyed a bunch of USB uh, hub chips from different vendors. Uh, one of the realizations that I had was to use USB 2 instead of USB 3, because with each uh, progressing version of USB, the requirements for your design become way stricter. Um, so it was way more likely to succeed if I were to build a USB 2 design instead of a USB 3 design. And even with the USB 2 design, I needed a bunch of help from people who really know their stuff, um, because I have not much clue about all of this. So uh, I finally settled on the Cypress HX2 VL series because it just has the best documentation. Uh, not only does it come with the data sheet, of course, every of the USB ICs comes with a data sheet, but this one also had an evaluation board. It had a bill of materials for the evaluation board and the full schematics, and there's a design checklist, and there's like a forum for support, all of that sort of stuff. And it really was much easier to get started with this once I had all of the resources. So here you can see the result. On the left-hand side, you can see the PCB layout. And on the right-hand side, you can see an actual build of this layout. Uh, if you take a look, you can see that the hub I see in the middle of the board is really the most important part. And then from there on, you have a bunch of USB traces to the internal ports and to the external ports. Uh, aside from that, and aside from all of the capacitors and stuff like that, you have a bunch of power circuitry, like the big capacitors here for the USB hot plug support. Um, and then lastly, at the bottom right, you have the overcurrent protection circuits so that if you plug in a bad device, maybe a broken device or something like that into one of the external ports, it will only shut off the external port instead of making your keyboard non-functioning, which I thought was a nice feature to have in the sub. So this worked, um, but there was one little issue with it. Um, I designed this first revision such that it would configure itself as bus powered, which it actually is, right? So. The distinction that USB makes here is bus powered versus self powered. And self powered means you connect an external power supply to whatever it is you're building. Um, because I didn't have any power supplies going into my keyboard and I find that kind of strange, of course this is bus powered, right? So this works well with the Logitech uh, unified receiver dongle that many of you might use and the YubiKey. 
but it didn't work with my external hard disk drive or a flash drive that I tried. And whenever I plugged these in, the kernel would give me a message saying that it rejected the configuration due to insufficient available bus power. This was weird because all of these devices did actually work on other USB hubs that I had lying around. And these were also bus powered USB hubs. So it turns out that all of the commercial hubs that I looked at claim to be self-powered, even though they're not, right? So they, they consciously violate the USB specification here because it allows them to circumvent the power calculation in the modern operating systems. For a self-powered device, you have 500 milliamps shared across all of the ports, whereas a bus-powered one has only 100 milliamps per port. Uh, because the USB flash drive that I tried requires 200 milliamps, you just can't use it on a spec-compliant uh, bus-powered USB hub. So, set it to self-powered. I originally thought that I would also need to add an EEPROM to configure the max power value, but it later turned out that the max power value is actually for the power that the device itself uses, so the power that the hub uses and not the power that it wants to pass on. But uh, I added the EEPROM in the next revision, and I found out that I could also set the manufacturer, product, and serial strings. And that is like a nice touch. So if you change these to your project names, then they show up nicely in the syslog. Um, and if you have the serial number unique, then you can write uh, UDEF rules that match on this particular device. So that's nice. The, the EEPROM is field programmable through a tool which the manufacturer calls Blaster. This tool, unfortunately, is Windows only and quite hard to install. On a modern Windows installation, you need to like um, jump through a bunch of dialogues to pick the specific driver that works and then change in the device manager which driver is used for what device and stuff like that. Um, I eventually got it working, but it was quite an ordeal. There is a Linux version, but only for the USB 3 series, not for the USB 2 series. And unfortunately, they're incompatible. Luckily, the protocol they use is quite simple, so as I, I was able to figure out um, how it would need to look like. So you can see uh, four lines of Go code here to interact with the device. Uh, you just open it using libusb, and then you send it a vendor-specific request uh, of type 14. Uh, you specify an index into the EEPROM, and then you get two bytes or you write two bytes, depending on the direction of the request. This is simple enough, and the EEPROM contents are easily uh, describable from the data sheet, which is actually very extensive. So that was all that I needed to get the program in working on Linux. So coming back uh, to the next revision, where not only did I add the EEPROM, but I also changed the USB hub to pretend that it is actually self-powered. Um, this made the flash drive magically work, so that's great. And the hard disk drive also worked, but only when connected as the only or the first device. Uh, this is because it requires quite a bit of power to spin up. And if you already have another power-hungry device on the hub, then there's just not enough power left. Um, that's sort of the downside of pretending to be self-powered when you're not. Um, but I only wanted to figure out whether it would work, and it does, so that's good. All right, so that's the USB hub. Now let's move on to input latency measurement. I figured that uh, if I'm already building a keyboard that has next to none input latency, why would I not also measure the rest of the stack as much as I could? And uh, the initial idea was to just do that in the keyboard firmware, and I did that. But then I figured it might be more useful if other people were able to replicate this if they wanted to and do their own measurements of their own hardware. So I figured I would port this from my keyboard, which probably not many people want to build, to the evaluation board uh, for this microcontroller that I already told you about. This evaluation board can be bought for about 60 US dollars in almost all of the bigger electronic stores. So it is very obtainable. And as you can see on the picture on the slide, it has a USB high-speed port. It also has a debug port, which actually is a fully blown JTAG kind of thing on the board. So that's also very convenient. And it has a bunch of different switches, but I just needed one switch. So I picked switch three and went with it. And once you have this board set up, um, you are going to program it with a custom measurement firmware. The firmware is pretty much my keyboard firmware, but it has a bunch of different tweaks. But Conceptually, it talks to the computer and tells it, hey, I'm a keyboard. So what happens when you do a measurement? Let's assume you press the switch three. What it does, it, it sends the caps lock key code to the computer, because the caps lock key is one of the only keys where you would actually get something back in response, which is the hit report packet telling the keyboard to turn on the caps lock LED. So this allows us to have two defined points in time between which we can measure. Now, of course, uh, if you pay close attention, you'll realize that when I press the switch three, it might take up to the USB polling interval for the switch to actually be transmitted to the host. So uh, down here, we have uh, one USB polling interval, so 125 microseconds of possible additional delay. Then we measure the actual processing latency, 
And then we also need to discard one more USB transaction time, which is one microframe, which is 125 microseconds, um, because that's for how long it takes for the computer to actually transmit the uh, hit report back to the keyboard or to the measurement device in this case. So now, uh, armed with this measurement device, um, I wanted to establish a baseline. And uh, for doing that, I analyzed what is actually in the path when you have a keyboard and uh, when you're using it with Linux. And the answer is, well, you have the USB host controller, which is like a physical chip in your uh, provided by Intel, usually in your main board. Then you have the Linux kernel, which contains a USB driver talking to that host controller. And it does contain the input subsystem. In the input subsystem, you again have another component called the Input Event API, or FDEF, which is responsible for transmitting the uh, key press from the kernel space into the user space. So what I set out to do was to write a very small program, and you can see the entire source code on the slide if you squint, um, which would directly read from FDEF, get a key press, and then send back the caps lock LED as quickly as it could. So this will notably exclude all of X11, Wayland, and whatever other parts are making up your graphical stack. Um, so this is really just how quickly can you handle a key press in user space, regardless of anything else. You can also verify these numbers um, on the computer by using Wireshark, because it can not only capture network traffic, it can also capture USB traffic used using the USB Mon kernel module. This view of the world excludes the USB pole, of course, and the USB transaction time. Uh, so this will be the raw processing latency, and these figures should really match what we're seeing in the measurement device minus the one transaction time. And the, line, the, the numbers line up, and the measurement result is that the processing latency I get uh, on a ThinkPad X1 Carbon from 2015 running Ubuntu 17.10 is about uh, 152 microseconds. So that's really not too bad. Then I figured I also wanted to know the uh, processing latency of my editor. So I wrote a little bit of Emacs Lisp, uh, which you can see on the right-hand side of the slide, which would connect to X11 and then provide a hook for the current buffer, where every time a key was inserted, it would toggle the caps lock LED. This can then be used in conjunction with the measurement device and remapping the keyboard such that the, the virtual keyboard of the measurement device, such that a caps lock key would no longer trigger caps lock, but rather produce another key, let's say A or N or whatever. And then I would just uh, press the button and watch it insert keys into my Emacs buffer and collect measurements of the end-to-end -end latency. So in this particular case, the Emacs processing latency on the same setup that I used for the previous figure is 278 microseconds. And this excludes the baseline. So let's sum it all up um, to get the end-to-end -end latency. So Remember, we have the matrix scan, which is about 100 microseconds, and we have the USB pole, which adds about 125 microseconds. The Linux processing latency baseline just for kernel and drivers and all of that is 152 microseconds, and then the Emacs processing latency is 278 microseconds. Um, the total figure is about 655 microseconds, but of course, this is only input and processing, and you still have the last part of the equation, which is the output latency. The output latency can be between zero, if everything is great, and 16 milliseconds, uh, which is if you just missed a scanline readout of your monitor, which is running at a refresh rate of 60 hertz, so you have a relatively coarse uh, frequency here that you can hit or miss. So the next obvious question is, well, okay, if our computer is in the range of like, you know, a millisecond plus minus 16 milliseconds, is that actually in the range that humans can perceive? And in order to experimentally answer that question, I decided to build a game. In this game, I wanted to answer the question, how well can humans perceive input latency? And I used a custom build of my keyboard, which was reprogrammable at runtime. Um, and it was programmable in such a way that you could add additional input latency. So in the game, in each round of the game, the uh, game would configure the keyboard controller with either, after a coin flip, no additional input latency or a certain number of additional input latency. And then it's up to the user to type a little bit and to come to a conclusion as to whether there is additional input latency in here or not. And then they would give their yes or no and maybe advance to the next level. The higher levels have smaller latency numbers. So I started with 100 milliseconds of additional input latency down to 75, 50, 25, and so on. Now, mind you, this is additional input latency, right? So if the setup that I was using at the time had like 30 milliseconds or so, we would be measuring or distinguishing between 30 and let's say 45, right? Um, not zero and 15, just saying. Uh, the result was that I had 17 people play it at last year's Chaos Communication Congress in Leipzig, 
And the most sensitive player out of these 17 reliably distinguished 15 milliseconds from no added input latency, which is quite an astonishing result, I find. Uh, it turns out that most of the other players had no trouble at all distinguishing 100 milliseconds from zero milliseconds, but many of them already could not distinguish 75 milliseconds from zero, which uh, is sort of a, an intuitive uh, explanation as to why other people are not so concerned with their keyboard input latency, right? The big manufacturers don't really care, and uh, this sort of confirms that for many people it might just not play a role. I think humans are just very good at adapting to a fixed set of latency, um, or maybe they just don't notice it at all because you don't really have the hand-eye coordination if you think about it. If you just type in like you know a directory path or a word or whatever it is that people are typing, then you sort of have, have the intent in your mind and you carry it out, but there's no coordination going on. So you can be very quick in carrying out your action and then there's some latency, but you probably might not even realize it. But the other result here is that the one, uh, one player of the 17 players here could really tell, right? That person was really sensitive to input latency. So maybe it's just that very few people actually care about it. So conclusions from this project. First of all, I now have a very fast keyboard, and I like it. Um, but of course, I'm biased. Uh, so it might be that I only like it because I built it. But nevertheless, it's good because I like it, so I'm happy. Um, also, I learned a lot about PCB design, about ARM microcontrollers, about bare metal programming, about how USB works, about how the human interface device protocol works, and so on. So it was a great learning opportunity. And then lastly, contrary to what some blog posts might want to make you think, modern computers actually have great processing latency, uh, as long as you choose good peripherals. So of course, you can pick like a bad or faulty keyboard that has like 100 milliseconds of latency on top of everything else. And then maybe you choose a monitor that is really cheap, and it has like 20 milliseconds of processing latency or something. But it turns out that uh, it is very achievable to actually get into a setup where you have a computer that has a great small number of input latency, or processing latency, rather, a keyboard that is reasonably good does not need to be as optimized as the one I presented here, um, and then a regular monitor which doesn't add a long delay, and then you should be good. So um, now I'm at the end of my slides, but we still have 10 minutes left for questions and answers. Um, if you are not so interested in the Q&A session, please uh, scan this QR code and fill in the feedback form. I'm also going to send around a link to that later along with the slides. So questions, please. Um, what's the total number? Um, so I think uh, if we just go back to this figure, uh, I think this is actually fairly reasonable. So in order to verify this number, and by this number I mean something between 0 and 16 or 17 milliseconds end to end, um, I actually used the high FPS camera in my iPhone to capture like you know key press to monitor changes things. Um, and while it is not always clear exactly how the imaging sensor in the camera works uh, and if there's some additional delay like that in there, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not fully confident in the scientific method that I used here because it's like very low tech, but it does confirm that um, the total end-to-end -end latency on my computer uh, is like in the range of between 0 and 20 milliseconds. The range is really much wider. Yes, this is true. So, actually, the keyboard is crazy fast. You don't need such a fast keyboard. Yes, <laughs> yes. No, I fully realize this. But uh, if you think about it the other way, um, what is it about the end-to-end -end latency that you can actually change? If you want to change your monitor, you only have the option of replacing it wholesale, right? So you need to find another monitor that either runs at a higher refresh rate, which is possible, um, or doesn't have as much additional latency to begin with. I think the, the monitor that I have has no additional latency to begin with. So the only thing I can do is exchange it with one that has a higher uh, frame rate. The computer itself is sort of fixed, right? You could find maybe micro-optimizations in the drivers or in the stack. But a number of 152 microseconds to begin with is pretty good, right? So the only thing that I can reasonably change is the keyboard. So I figured I'd minimize this so that I have more sort of spare capacity, if you will, in the rest of the stack, right? So I can now afford the luxury of using like a bloated Atom-based editor or something like that, and it's still fast, right? <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. I haven't measured it. Yes, please. If anything, what's next? <laughs> right, uh, it's a good question. So what's next? Um, so the matrix scan that we have here could be reduced if you were to uh, wire up your keyboard such that every key is wired up to a GPIO input on a microcontroller directly. 
However, I don't think that's actually reasonable, right? Um, one thing that I'm personally very interested in, rather than optimizing the keyboard any further, because as other people have noticed, it's actually plenty fast now, um, is actually trying out uh, one of the higher refresh rate monitors. Uh, this is more of a theoretical thing for me, because I have an 8K monitor at home, and you cannot buy 8K monitors that have anything higher than 60 hertz. So I wouldn't be able to switch, even if it turns out that uh, like a 240 hertz monitor is so much more convenient or pleasurable. Um, it would be a data point, and then I would need to move back to my setup. So maybe I'll do it, maybe I won't, I don't know. Um, but I think I'm reasonably happy with this. Um, for what it's worth, I also measured other operating systems like Windows and Mac OS with regards to their processing latency. And it turns out they're all equally fast. Um, so the question really is, is not, uh, is there anything to optimize there? Is there like software bloat in there? Because I'm reasonably convinced by now that there isn't. And it's just peripherals and they can be exceptionally bad, but most of them will usually be good. So for me, the, the input latency part of this project is sort of satisfied. Yeah, it's a very good question. Does the USB have introduced additional latency? Um, I haven't actually measured it, but it is conceivable that it would probably introduce one microframe of additional latency. Um, but I don't know for sure, and I haven't. I, I didn't find a description of how the USB protocol works. Uh, you know, that would lend itself to this particular question. Uh, the USB standard is very, very complicated. It's literally a PDF with hundreds of pages. So I skimmed through it, and it might be hidden in there somewhere, or it might be that I wouldn't actually need to measure it. But it turned out to also be pretty hard to get like a logic analyzer that would understand USB or anything like that. Um, if any of you has any sort of context into like USB uh, IF certification kind of thing or self-service conformance tests for USB, which I think do exist, but it's like very pricey equipment that only companies have, uh, I would be very interested to sort of run my USB hub against the spec test or something, figure out if it's if it's wrong or if it's correct. Question, does it matter where you plug uh, your keyboard into your computer? Yeah, question is, does it matter where you plug it in? Yes, it does. Um, what you want to pay attention to is to plug it into a port that is not backed by another hub. Uh, this might sound funny in the beginning, because most ports shouldn't be backed by another hub. But it turns out that some cheap computers actually have like the front panel USB ports are like a hub that is connected internally. And that, of course, uh, might not be great. It might not be great, not necessarily for the input latency question that we had earlier, but maybe also for power distribution, right? Because then you have the whole self-powered versus bus-powered kind of thing, and you yeah, cannot maybe, draw as much power. But even with that, there's still the USB ports in it, right? They're the ones that are directly from the, all like the platform controller hub, and then yeah. the ones that are like over, I don't know. Like Usually they have so many ports that the CPUs don't, don't, don't provide as many, so manufacturers have more. Right. I I, that's, I've been wondering about that, and I haven't right. I don't have any method to, to measure, and I can't yeah. tell the difference, but I'm yeah. always wondering like, where yeah. to put it. So the way I inter interpret it is that uh, you have uh, a chipset which has a number of USB ports that you can provide, and then it's up to the mainboard manufacturer to place physical USB ports in like the output headers. Now, if the manufacturer adds like say three USB ports, um, then uh, you would need to have more in the case, right? Which is what you mentioned. You would typically have like these connections of the front panel USB ports to like an internal connector on the mainboard. I think. These are indistinguishable. Like it doesn't matter if you plug into one that is directly on the main board or if you plug into one that is in the front panel but directly connected to the main board, main board. Um, because the cable is just so short, it doesn't add any like delays or anything. It's well within the spec. Um, the cable that you will plug into that USB port will have more variance than what you do internally, I think. Um, the only thing that might be different is if you add like uh, you know a PCI Express USB controller or something like that, because then um, maybe that is slower, or at least it might be different in terms of power consumption that you can get there. Not entirely sure, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, like anything you can find in a not entirely cheap computer will be roughly the same quality. I mean, it might go without saying, but you maybe shouldn't put it into your monitor. Right, which has a USB hub that is usually right. a cheap USB hub. Um, so just connect all peripherals into your computer and not necessarily into your monitor, and then I think you will have less trouble with USB in general and this particular project in particular. Yeah. If you use a USB hub, then you have the shared management, and particularly also the shared microframes, so maybe if you have a different peripheral that uses a certain number of microframes, then that will 
plus some delay for the Yes, the yes. So the, for the recording, the remark was that if you uh, add a USB hub, you will have shared microframes and shared bandwidth. This is correct. So if you had like two devices that would say, hey, I want to be pulled every microframe, then uh, every device would be pulled on every other microframe. So the bandwidth sort of splits like that. Um, yeah, it's a good remark. Uh, in the very back first. OK, question is whether a PS2 port would be faster. Um, you can sometimes read this, like on some websites, right, that uh, a PS2 port is faster than a USB port for keyboards uh, because it uses interrupts. And that is true until you enter USB 3, which I'm, I'm not aware of any USB 3 keyboard, just to say it. So yeah, I think, strictly speaking, you could eliminate the USB pole uh, line that I have here in the, in the total um, by using PS2. Now, the question is, would you really want to constrain yourself to a PS2 mainboard? Because there's very few of them. And it might be that the PS2 port on them is not actually a real PS2 port, but it's emulated in some kind of way. And then maybe there's some additional delay in there that you can't really see. I'm not entirely sure, but I would be suspicious of this. The other answer is, well, I want to use the keyboard on my laptop as well, at which point you have to make it USB. There was uh, another question here. Yeah. So if I want to measure latency on my keyboard, I mean, camera is probably the easiest way to do this, right? Camera is also the least precise way to do it, right? Because all of the figures that we have here are well under the four milliseconds that like my iPhone can record at 240 frames per second. So you would need maybe a 1,000 frames a second camera to get any sort of reasonable um, measurements. But the one common trap to fall into is to measure like whenever your finger moves to whenever something happens, which is what Dan Liu did in his blog post. Um, and I think what you really want to do is measure from between when the keyboard detects the key as pressed, or as activated, rather, um, to whenever something happened, maybe on your screen even, right? So, the, so how, how do you measure your own keyboard? It's a good question, right? Um, I can easily lend you like the uh, development board for measuring your processing latency, but measuring your keyboard is harder than that. Um, ideally, if you were able to modify the firmware, right? <laughs> I mean, you could also use the, the same shape of uh, hooking, uh, hooking something in that uh, generates a key press electronically and then measures when the capsule of that comes on. Yes, absolutely. The remark was uh, maybe change your keyboard such that it would electronically generate a key press, and then you measure from between that and the capsule LED. Yeah, it's true. Maybe we could even uh, use the measurement board here. Um, and wire up like one of the GPIOs here to actually just generate like the key switch in an arbitrary keyboard that you sort of plug into like that. That would be possible if you wanted to do it. I could totally borrow this. Yes. Yeah. Well, sort of, maybe, but um, I wanted to have that USB hub uh, for uh, the reason of also connecting external devices, like the Logitech receiver a dongle, and maybe a USB flash drive, right? Um, and also, the USB hub has one additional benefit, which is that when you replicate this design for a new keyboard, or I have a friend of mine who also wants to do this, um, you no longer need to cut the internal cable or replace the cable entirely because now you can interface with the proprietary connector. So it becomes sort of a less invasive method of modifying this keyboard, yeah, the, the keyboard in its entirety. Because you just need to remove the two existing PCBs and replace them instead of sort of changing everything. Yeah, it fits perfectly. Yes. Can you say something about the game that you uh, wrote? How you, uh, I assume you tried to like, minimize latency on that one as well. Right, so yeah. Where, like, did you question drivers to get like, the scan out of and so on to basically synchronize it to yeah. the screen? That's a fair point. I didn't go as far as that. Um, the only thing I did was uh, I actually ran it in a, in a Linux text console so that there would be no X11 involved or no graphics like that involved, um, which seemed like the fastest, at least my measurements confirmed that this was the fastest I could do with my computer. Um, but also keep in mind that I wasn't necessarily trying to achieve like a zero latency setup in its end-to-end -end, uh, characteristic, but rather a realistic setup and then determine what happens if your latency degrades, right? Um, and for that, this is exactly the setup that you would want to have. Um, 
it, I'm aware that this is just like you know an anecdotal experiment with just a bunch of people, not much science involved here, but I think it provides sort of an intuition for how to interpret the results. And you're already below the threshold where people, where most people would uh, realize it. Yeah, yeah, I think so, yes. I, I think, do you publish the game? I can publish the game, yeah. Because I, I think like rather than actually knowing the latency on the board, I'm just interested in whether I should start <laughs> yeah. Right. right. So the game would tell me. Yeah. How much wiggle room there is. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there are a couple of things that are not great about the game. First of all, it's not very polished. There was like a bug in there, but I can fix that, of course. But also, uh, given that it requires a Kinesis keyboard, many people are not actually too familiar with typing on a Kinesis in the first place. So for some people, there was the hurdle that they just couldn't get into the setup enough to judge whether there's input latency. Um, you know, maybe if we would need to modify your keyboard in order to make an experiment that has any value to you. Yeah. yeah. But we could change the game to just like generally add additional display latency and see how much yeah. room we have and until you notice that. that this is true, so and this already exists. So you can find such software on the internet. Um, I just figured I have a setup where I already know exactly how much input latency I'm adding, and I have measured and verified this. So I figured I wouldn't bother with like software where I don't know if it works as advertised or not. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good question. So my score was, I think I got to uh, level four or so, which is like two levels above the 15 milliseconds. So I was like at 30 or so. Um, so I'm not the most sensitive person with regards to input latency, but I've done the project, so. Any other questions? Okay, we're a little over time, so thank you very much for your attention.